Hello there, and welcome to Sunday to Sunday. I'm Carol Lehan, and there is no Sunday quite as important as this one since it's Easter Sunday. Tony Marinelli is here with me to explain the scriptures. Tony is a devoted father, and together with his wife, Pat, is raising three children on Long Island, where he is also a teacher at Holy Trinity High School. The Sunday to Sunday players will proclaim the wonderful story of Easter, which is found in the Gospel of John. Maggie Linton will join us. Maggie will be looking at the Passover feast, which is an important part of Easter on Bible background. The Paulist choristers are celebrating the importance of Jerusalem on this weekend of all weekends, and will bring our program to a close with a hymn prayer. It's all part of what's going to happen here on Sunday to Sunday for Easter Sunday, 1999. Christians are called on to be strong witnesses. How do we know that? Because we have today's first reading, for one thing. In the text, Peter says, we are witnesses of all that he did. And so they were, literally. As he stands in the house of Cornelius, having been summoned by Cornelius, who is following the instructions of an angel, Peter proclaims all the events of Jesus' death and of his resurrection. He tells Cornelius and the household gathered there that they, not all the people, but those who ate and drank with Jesus, have been witnesses to Jesus' resurrection, and that now they must preach Jesus' message to the world. It's a powerful story. You'll find the story in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. We come to Paul's letter to the Corinthians and need to understand that he is upbraiding the Corinthians because Paul indicates that they do not understand that believing demands certain kinds of behavior. Certain behavior, he points out, is required for those who are committed to Christ. So he uses a simple example, saying that it's important to celebrate the Feast of Easter with new yeast so that the dough will remain unspoiled. The reading is in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. And the Gospel is in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. Those are the readings for this Easter Sunday. Take time to make sure all the members of your group have read the scriptures. Be sure that you share what you think the theme of the scriptures might be, and then come back and join us. Welcome, Tony, and Happy Easter. Happy Easter, Carol. The Gospel today tells the story of Mary and Peter and the beloved disciple discovering the empty tomb of Jesus. I noticed that John tells the story differently. No one else includes the presence of this beloved disciple at the tomb of Jesus. Who was the beloved disciple? And was it the Apostle John? Uh, John has been the traditional answer from the church. From early on, the beloved disciple was identified with him. But the gospel really never says that. And today, most scholars don't accept that theory, that oh. it's John. We don't really know exactly who he is. That's the problem. In all likelihood, uh, the beloved disciple was someone that Jesus knew during his lifetime. And this beloved disciple went on to establish his own community of faith and certainly became beloved within that community. The Gospel was likely written by one, maybe more, of his disciples, of this beloved dis disciple. So the evangelist makes this disciple the special hero in the Gospel. He's the one who has a special relationship of intimacy with Jesus. And that's going to be a large theme throughout the Gospel. Now all Christians are called to intimacy and love with Christ and each other. The real Christians are the ones who love. The reading today is a bit peculiar. Mary gets to the tomb first. She doesn't go in, but somehow knows that the body of Jesus is missing. The disciple outpaces Peter to the tomb, but then lets him in first. The beloved disciple believes, but apparently Peter does not. 
Is there some type of rivalry between Peter and the beloved disciple? Yeah, it, it, it sounds that way, doesn't it? Uh, but I, I don't think it's so much a rivalry, but, but the writer is clearly trying to make a distinction. By the time this gospel was written, Peter had clearly established a position of leadership among the twelve in the early church and among the communities. And the Gospel of John recognizes that fact and respects it. So Peter gets there first. But the author of John also wants to show that the beloved disciple had a very special role as well. Peter may have been first in authority, but the beloved disciple was first in love and the first to come to faith in the resurrection. Mary Magdalene's role seems very limited in this story. What happened to Jesus appearing to her? We try to remember that the author of this gospel was writing about events that had occurred 70 years prior. Mm -hmm. So he's familiar with different stories related to the empty tomb. Now there is this story about Mary and the women visiting the tomb. And there's another story about Peter going to the tomb. And there's a story about angels announcing the resurrection and Jesus appearing to Mary. So the Gospel of John is, is rearranging some of the details, I think, to suit its own purposes. What is the point that he's trying to make? At first, the empty tomb that they discover is, is just an empty tomb. It's just a fact. And Peter and Mary don't know what to make of it. But the beloved disciple does. The empty tomb becomes the sign of Jesus' resurrection. So the story unveils the meaning of the empty tomb which can only be known and understood through intimacy with Christ. So John does not include the story of Jesus appearing to Mary? Well, he does include it, actually, but we don't read it today. It's read on the Tuesday after Easter, and it will come right after the Gospel passage that, that we read today. And in fact, he develops the story much more fully. Mary will come to recognize Jesus only when he calls her by name. So that's very, very significant. Once again, we see the key to knowing the risen Lord is in an intimate relationship of love with Him. So the resurrection is really an experience of faith and love for the disciples. That's right. To encounter the risen Lord is, is not like meeting somebody on the street. Instead, it's, it's more like coming face to face with life's deepest meaning and the true meaning and identity of Jesus of Nazareth as the meeting place of God and humanity. While well, you think about the importance of love in the relationship between God and ourselves, listen and watch as the Sunday to Sunday players proclaim the Gospel of John. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. She saw that the stone had been moved away so she ran off to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and told them, The Lord has been taken from the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. At that, Simon Peter and the other disciple started out toward the tomb. They were running side by side, but then the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He did not enter, but bent down to peer in and saw the wrappings lying on the ground. Presently, Simon Peter came along behind him and entered the tomb. He observed the wrappings on the ground and saw the piece of cloth which had covered the head, not lying with the wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had arrived first at the tomb went in. He saw and believed. Remember, as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Tony has some thoughts about belief and its importance. Thank you, Carol. I've spent a good part of the last 20 years of my life studying and teaching theology. Theology is often described as faith seeking understanding. We believe that Jesus is the Lord and Messiah, the Son of God. We commit our lives to living as His followers. Theology seeks to use the human mind to reflect on the experience and the meaning of this faith. Christianity is not blind or ignorant faith. It takes human reason very seriously. Having said that, I must admit that there are things that we believe that do not come to us simply as a matter of reason. 
They come to us as a matter of revelation. Without faith, they seem to make little sense to the human mind. In fact, without faith, they are simply not to be grasped. The resurrection is one of these articles of faith. To a purely secular, scientific mind, the resurrection of Jesus will defy belief. There's no empirical evidence to support the hypothesis. When people die, they die. Jesus was a human being, therefore his life ended finally and totally with his death. But the fact is that many people claim to have encountered the risen Lord after his death. Now, no one claims to have witnessed the actual resurrection itself, but some do claim to have encountered the risen Jesus. Why would we believe them? I'd like to suggest that the evidence for the resurrection is in those who proclaim it. Indeed, this frightened, confused group of disciples became willing to lay down their lives based on the reality of the resurrection. It was they who were raised up, as well as Jesus. The power of Christ's resurrection pulsed through their hearts and lives, and the power was almost tangible. It utterly transformed them. For Paul, the resurrection of Jesus meant that Christ had risen within him. And I think that every Christian should at some time have at least a sense of what that means. Perhaps it's only a great saint who could say with Paul, it is no longer I that live, but Christ in me. But every Christian should have some sense of the power of Christ's death and resurrection in their life. It's the risen Christ who calls us to rise from the death of apathy. Christ seeks to raise us up from intolerance and bigotry and violence. It's the risen Christ who calls us to raise up those who are beaten down. The Lord conquered the grave 2,000 years ago. This was not meant to be so much a remarkable event in history as it was meant to be a sign of our destiny and a call to transform our lives today. On this Easter, let's pray that Christ may Easter in us, may raise us up from all that seeks to entomb us. Let's pray that we may be transformed by God's love into living witnesses to the great truth that we celebrate this day. The Lord is risen. Thanks, Tony. We have starters for you. The first one is, what does it mean to be a witness to Jesus in today's society? A second starter goes like this. If faith is essential for belief in the resurrection, is reasoning about the resurrection possible? Why is intimacy with God so important to the Christian? With those starters, we hope you have a great discussion. When you've completed it, be sure to come back here for Maggie Linton. In keeping with Easter, our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrate the Passover. I've asked Maggie Linton to tell us more about that, which she does on this Bible background. You may know about the harvest moon or the song Blue Moon, but have you ever heard of the Passover moon? That's the first full moon of spring that always comes around the Jewish holiday, the Passover. What is the Passover? Well, it's a celebration of freedom. In a sense, it's a religious 4th of July. But it's different. Different because the Jews were slaves to the Egyptians and they wanted out. So they prayed to God for help. Meanwhile, back in the desert, Moses got a message from God, let my people go. But the Pharaoh, ruler of the Egyptians, refused. 
So God sent many plagues upon all the people, but he wanted to spare the faithful Jews. So he told Moses to tell the people to slaughter a lamb and put the lamb's blood on their doorpost. Then he told them to be prepared to leave. They were to eat a hasty meal, which means they had to use unleavened bread and bitter herbs because that was what was handy. That night, the angel of death visited Egypt, but he passed over the houses where the blood of the lamb was smeared on doorpost. The firstborn sons of all the Egyptians died. The firstborn sons of the Jews in Egypt were spared. The Passover moon that shone that night in Egypt was a witness to God's goodness to his faithful people. And that same Passover moon shines today in celebration of the Jews' deliverance from Egypt over 3,000 years ago. For Bible Background, I'm Maggie Linton. Tony, what is God calling you to do this week? You go first. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, Easter is the central mystery of our faith in Christ. And yet, when you sit down and say, okay, now it's Easter, what am I going to do? Yeah. Besides the eggs. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't do the death resurrection thing. <laughs> but as I thought about it, as you could probably tell from the reflection piece, um, this idea of allowing Easter to raise me up and allowing me then, to hopefully, to raise other people up. And in thinking about that, there, there are a couple of things that, that have been kind of hanging over my head and I've been wondering about whether I should do them. Um, like I'm, I'm really good with I, I'm really good with old people, you know, and um, just I, I go to nursing homes. I feel like I'm home. You know? <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, <laughs> and a lot of people get spooked by that stuff, and and mm. I don't, you know. And so I, I'm I've, I've always had my fingers in that a little bit in visiting people in nursing homes and things. And, and I can see what a difference that it makes when people know you're coming and they look forward to you coming. So I'm thinking of expanding my horizons. There's a jail near where I live. And, and I've often thought, you know, Tony, you should really go do some work over there, at least to see what it's like. So I Might not be spooky. Might, yeah, well, <laughs> actually, I, see, I'm more spooked by that. The nursing Is that home, right? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. But maybe, I, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll that, that idea of being a witness to the resurrection. I mean, who's in a tomb? You know, I think of people in nursing homes as being right, in a tomb, right. you know. But jails are, are pretty brutal too, you know. Maybe there's something I could do there. Maybe not, but, but I think I'll call over and, and maybe see if I can set up something for the summer since we're getting close to the end of the school year. That's great get my feet wet that way. So, we'll see. So this um, entombing idea made me think of uh, my friend Edie who had the brain tumor operation. Right. And she now, I think she feels enslaved <laughs> yeah. or, uh, in this uh, body that, that uh, is, it's new to her because she doesn't have control over it the same way that she's doing. It was very successful operation, but she can't walk and, yeah. and do what she normally did. So I think I need to set up something. She taught my sons um, this past summer, and uh, I think I need to set up um, a special event for her and bring a whole bunch of the kids that she taught and, and, um, and see if we can, um, you know, it's, it's not like a resurrection, but it might just be a, <laughs> it might be a spark. Uh -huh. for her uh, because I, I think I was telling you before that once something happens, um, some crisis like that, that there are all these people and all these energies praying for, um, I know there were so many people praying for Edie, uh, and then afterwards she, it was successful and everyone goes their own way and I'm one of them, you know, it was almost as if I had to catch up on a whole bunch of other things right. because I had um, stopped everything for this crisis. Yeah. You know, so, um, but uh, I need to keep her in my active life. Uh huh. Yeah. So, this week. Yeah. Good luck with that. Tony and I have told you what we think is important about God's call. Now it's your turn to do the same. 
When you're finished with that task, come back to the tape for a closing prayer. When you get right down to it, there are some hymns that I love, and so they get to be a part of the program. And Rise Up Jerusalem is one of those. The Paulist choristers sing it. the day is near. Sing all you people, wash away your fear. Everyone get ready for salvation is near. Emmanuel shall come, the long-awaited one. Emmanuel, come to All of us here on Sunday to Sunday want to wish you a wonderfully happy Easter. Our prayer for you is that the risen Lord will strengthen you in witness and deepen the love that you share with Him. Till next time, I'm Carol Lehan. Bye.
Hello there, I'm Carol Lehan. Welcome to Sunday to Sunday. Father John Ganey joins me today. Father G travels a great deal in search for a better view for his viewers, and today we see him in Israel. The Sunday to Sunday players will proclaim the gospel that has made the Apostle Thomas such a famous man. Maggie Linton will tell us more about early Christian communities and their customs on Bible background. And Martha Reyes will bring our program to a close with a hymn prayer. That's what we've lined up for you on this edition of Sunday to Sunday for the second Sunday of Easter, 1999. Today's first reading is always one that catches me, startles me, because today's first reading is a description of a Christian community, and I seldom have experienced what Luke describes in Acts. There are four elements that Luke points out as being essential to the Christian community. The first key to living a Christian life is the teaching of the apostles, and of course we still have that. The bishops of our church are our apostles. But it seems as though the way things were taught in the early community were a bit different. They were certainly less complex. The second characteristic of a Christian community is that they shared their lives together. Now I see that when I go to monasteries, such as the Trappists. It also is something that Christians can see in religious communities and in some communities of lay people. But I have a lovely home in Colombia, and most of my friends live the same way. So it's a bit disconcerting to see how the early Christians lived, if indeed such community living was of the essence of Christianity. A third characteristic of the early Christians, and one which we certainly continue today, is the fact that they broke the bread of the Eucharist together. That same kind of celebration still takes place in churches and communities all over the world. And finally, Luke points out that the early Christians prayed together. And Christians today do that same thing. I'm familiar with all kinds of families who pray together and aware of groups like Curcio, Teams of Our Lady, lay groups of all kinds, and of course religious communities where people gather together to pray for and with one another. You'll find the reading in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Being a Christian in the early days of the church was a disruptive influence in lots of people's lives, or at least that's what we'd been led to understand by Peter's letter to the people of that time. He notes that while the Christians are rejoicing because of the great gifts that God has given them, they are also suffering through various trials. He notes that the, the faith the people have is more precious than gold. I see Peter here as encouraging the new converts to Christianity, telling them that he knows and appreciates the burden they have undertaken. The wonderful pastoral sense that Peter shows will be found in the first letter of Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And the gospel reading will be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Be sure that everyone in your group has read the scriptures for today. Take time to share about the theme and come back and join us when you're ready. Father Ganey has joined me. John has lots of lessons for us today. Well, he surely does, Carol, and we won't get to all of them. In fact, I'm going to limit us to the first part of today's pericope so that we can have at least just kind of one focus. And the first point to make is what? Well, in the first verse of today's reading, we hear the words, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Now, the key word amidst all those words is disciples. It means the general community and not just the apostolic leadership. That the apostles were in the room is probably true, but there was a larger gathering of people, and for John it's key that the gathering represents the faith community and not just the apostles. One of the phrases that's always bothered me in this reading is the phrase, for fear of the Jews. It tends to draw up images of anti-Semitism. Yeah, well, I can see why you might think that way, Carol. And John did have difficulty with the Jewish authorities of his day. 
If the gospel was written at the end of the first century, as many believed it was, then there was conflict between the new Christians and the Jewish authorities. The new Christians were being put out of the synagogue by the synagogue's leaders, not an easy thing for them, and, but perfectly understandable. But it's difficult for them and reminds us a bit of Peter's letter to the early Christians in which he reminds the people, especially the new converts, that life will be difficult because of their new faith in Christ. Is John anti-Semitic? No. Those in charge at the time were Jewish authorities. They could have been Roman, but they were Jewish. And it was the authority that he was having difficulty with. There's a wonderful phrase in the few verses we're dealing with today, peace be with you. It's a beautiful phrase, Carol, you're right. Quite common also in another sense. You'll see it used in many places in the scriptures. But here, it also has another meaning, and that is that Jesus fulfills another promise from the farewell discourse at the Last Supper, the gift of his peace. Already, the community of faith is feeling persecuted and hated, so John is reminding the community that they need not be afraid of the authorities who are giving them a difficult time, but instead to accept the challenges that come to them because of their new faith with a sense of peace. Why does Jesus breathe on the disciples? Well, I could say something like to test his new mint, oh, yeah. but that would get me on all kinds of trouble. So basically it's to show how Jesus gives the gift of the Spirit to the community so that they can continue his work. The verb that's used here, to breathe, is the only time that this form, this particular form, occurs in the New Testament in Greek. What it brings to mind is the breathing of the breath of life into the first human in Genesis, and it also recalls the description of the breath of life in Ezekiel. So John is telling us in his theological way that the breath of life that Jesus gives to his disciples and therefore to all of us is a new and a second creation. And I just know that means something important for us as Christians today. Yeah, of course. Looking at John's gospel here, Carol, it seems quite clear to me that those who believe in Jesus receive new life as children of God. And the Holy Spirit that Jesus breathed into us is the force that sustains that new life. As you think about new life and the Spirit, listen and watch as the Sunday to Sunday players proclaim the Gospel from St. John. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the evening of that first day of the week, even though the disciples had locked the doors of the place where they were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood before them. Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. At the sight of the Lord, the disciples rejoiced. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive men's sins, they are forgiven them. If you hold them bound, they are held bound. It happened that one of the twelve, Thomas, the name means twin, was absent when Jesus came. The other disciples kept telling him, We have seen the Lord. I'll never believe it without probing the nail prints of his hands, without putting my fingers into his nail marks and my hand into his side. A week later, the disciples were once more in the room, and this time Thomas was with them. Despite the locked doors, Jesus came and stood before them. Peace be with you. Thomas, take your fingers and examine my hands. Put your hand in my side. Do not persist in your unbelief, but believe. My Lord and my God. You became a believer because you saw me. Blessed are they who have not seen and have believed. Jesus performed many other signs as well in the presence of his disciples, signs not recorded here, but these have been recorded to help you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, so that through this faith you may have life in his name. Father G has some thoughts about mission and faith. Thanks, Carol. The first time I went to Ireland, now many years ago, I sat in my dad's home and thought, this is where it all began. That's not true, of course, because it's difficult to ever get at the beginnings of a family. But I think most of us would understand my feelings when I sat where my dad had sat as a boy and recalled all the things he'd told me over the years about his home in Ireland. 
In a certain sense, we have a way today of seeing, reliving our Christian beginnings. At Easter, Jesus gives us the gift of the Spirit and articulates our mission as Christians. John is telling us that the church's ongoing life as a community of faith, and we are that community of faith today, our ongoing life as the people of God who continue Jesus' work in our world begins or derives from the Easter promises that Jesus made and the gifts that he gave us. So what's the mission? What are we called upon as a community of faith to do? Some will say, hey, it's right there in the gospel, and they'd be right. But what does Jesus mean when he says, as the Father has sent me, so do I send you? That doesn't help much. We know in one sense what Jesus did, but how will we follow him? I think the key to following the mission Jesus gave us is in combining the gift of the Spirit with Jesus' command to love. When we love one another as Jesus loved us, not an easy task in and of itself, we reveal God to the world. When we do that, when we witness to God's love in the world, we make it possible for the other people in the world to enter into a relationship with the God who is infinite love. In choosing or rejecting this relationship, people determine whether or not they will be sinful people. So, our mission as a faith community is to bear constant witness to the love of God in Jesus Christ. When we do that, then we are sent as Jesus was sent. That's when the gift of the Spirit can be seen and touched and we can live in that peace that Jesus promises to all who choose to follow him. Thanks, Father G. It's discussion time. To help you get into the discussion, I have a few starters for you. What does it mean to you when Jesus says, peace be with you? What is your mission as part of a community of faith? How do we pray together as a community? When you've had plenty of time for a good discussion, come back to the tape. Maggie Linton will be waiting. We've been spending a good portion of our time today talking about the early Christian communities as well as talking about today's community of faith. Maggie Linton has a log or two to add to the fire about early Christian communities on this Bible background. If you're like me and Sunday is your only day of rest, you probably rise at different times. This sometimes leads to church shopping, looking around for a Sunday service to suit your rising time. You soon discover that though the substance of community worship stays the same, the form can be very different. Well, that led me to thinking, I wonder what it was like way back in the early church. In the time immediately after Jesus' death, his followers were called the brethren, the believers, the disciples, the Apostle Peter tells us that it was in Antioch that Jesus' followers were first called Christians. Since the Greek word Christos means the anointed one and the Hebrew word Messiah also means the anointed one, it is easy to see the connection. To become a member of this early Christian community, three things were necessary. To believe in the words of Jesus, to repent of your sins, and to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Many sold their property and gave the money to the apostles to distribute according to need. Acts 4 says, They were of one heart and soul and held everything in common. What we must remember about these early Christians is that they were mostly Judeans living in the land where Jesus had walked. They expected Jesus to return at any moment, certainly within their own lifetime. They insisted that both a firm belief and loving behavior were vital to followers of Jesus. So the early Christians lived as loving members of one family, 
longing to see God's kingdom established here on earth. For Bible Background, I'm Maggie Linton. Well, Father G, I'm going to ask you to begin this week with what you believe God is calling you to do. Right. Um, I don't know why I get stuck with going first, but anyway, here we are. Uh, <laughs> the um, the uh, thing I, I want to look at is mission, basically. I think it's very easy for us to kind of get lost in where our, our mission is. And, uh, you know, when Jesus says, you know, do as I've done, you know, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, right. I mean, that's easy. No, it's mm -hmm. not. No. Uh, and I think th that we really have to define what that means today. You know, the, the mission that the disciples had in, um, you know, the 50th year of Christianity or whenever it was that John wrote this gospel is a lot different than the one we have as we're kind of plunging along into the millennium. So I think this week I'm just going to spend a little time saying to myself, what is my mission in the church? and in society. See, I think we can tend to forget the importance of bringing the church to society and bringing what the church brings to society, to that society. It's, it's very easy to get kind of caught up in our own little parish, in our own little group, in our own little whatever, bunch of Christians, mm -hmm. even our own little family, and forget that we really do have an obligation to get, our, get what we believe and what we uh, feel and understand as Christians into the marketplace. So I'm going to be kind of reflecting on how am I doing that? You know, are my radio shows being the way they should be as the television we're doing, really reaching out and touching people where they are uh, in, a, in a thoughtful, reflective way? The, the trick in mission, uh, <laughs> I guess there are a couple tricks, but one that I'm thinking about is um, the, keeping the fire going. Yeah. Uh, you know, the early apostles, the ones that were closest, had met Jesus, had spent time with Jesus, and the fire was there, and they certainly had the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then, and then John writing later, keeping that fire going and fueling for that, for his audience. Right. Even you know? though they were pretty fearful. I mean, it's a very right. interesting thing that even though they were right there, had the, had, the, had, the, had the man right there, right. that they still were fearful. That's a so, um, so for me, I guess I was thinking at Christmas time, in our family, in our prayer life, we had the fire going, getting ready for Christmas. And I mean that we would read before eating. Uh, we would read from the Bible every day, and and there was a specific um, <laughs> climax, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so the the fuel was there, and and keeping that going during the year right. when when some of our um, uh, major events of the church are spread out. Sure, and, yeah. Lent um, is okay. We, we do it during Lent. <laughs> yeah, kind of, that yeah, catches yeah, yeah. on, you know. But once Easter comes, it's woo. Right. Yeah, free time. <laughs> we got time. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. So I guess uh, keeping the fire going, it will be Good. my task this week. Okay. I think you could have guessed that we'd spend some time on mission, but now it's your time to wrestle with the question: What is God calling me to do? When the brief discussion is complete, come back here. Whenever I think about a community of faith, I am reminded of Martha Reyes because her songs are so inclusive of the faith community. And that's why I've asked her to bring this program to a close with a hymn prayer.
saber más de ti Mi Dios, cual buen alfarero Quebrántame, transformame Moldeame a tu imagen, Señor That's it for this week on Sunday to Sunday. Next week, Tony Marinelli will be here explaining the third Sunday of Easter. Be sure to join us. Till then, for all of us at Paulist Media Works, I'm Carol Lehan. Bye. Hello there. Welcome to Sunday to Sunday. I'm Carol Lehan. Tony Marinelli will be with me today. Tony teaches theology and is the head of the theology department at Holy Trinity High School on Long Island. The Sunday to Sunday players will be proclaiming the gospel. This Sunday, in contrast to the past few weeks, the gospel is from Luke. What was early Christian worship like? Maggie Linton will explore that question on Bible background. And we'll close out our program with a prayer hymn from St. Augustine's Choir. And when the St. Augustine's Choir is around, there's lots of joy, too. It's all right here for you on Sunday to Sunday for the third Sunday of Easter, 1999. Lots of folks had gathered in one spot because of the Jewish feast of Pentecost, a celebration of the giving of the law to the people by God on Mount Sinai. It was in the midst of that feast that we find Peter speaking for the Twelve and telling the people who had gathered that Jesus was the Messiah they were looking for. In Hebrew, Messiah means anointed. In Greek, Christ means anointed. When the kingdom was destroyed, the Jews hoped that someone, a Messiah, would come to restore it. 
that someone was to come from the line of David, and that someone would be anointed by the Lord's Spirit as David was. This was the essence of the hope for a Messiah. Peter steps into that history and tells the people that Jesus of Nazareth is that person, the Messiah whom they seek. How can they know it? Because of his signs and wonders. And the major wonder, of course, as Peter points out, is that while David's tomb was known to them with David in it, the Christ tomb is empty, and that because God raised him from the dead, it's a powerful argument, argued powerfully. You'll find the reading in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 14, and verses 22 to 33. There are many new Catholics in our church these days because of the rite for Christian initiation of adults that has its high point on Easter Sunday. How fitting it is for them, and for all of us with them, to hear Peter tell the new converts to Christianity of his day how they are to lead their lives now that they are Christian. Basically, he tells the new converts that they are to be like God, holy as he is holy. Peter also reminds the neophytes that they must persevere in this new faith they have found. That will demand hope, and since they have been purchased at a great price, they must also live blameless lives. You can read the entire discourse in the first letter of Peter, chapter 1, verses 17 through 21. And you'll find the final reading in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Make sure everyone in your group has read those verses, and once you've done that, share about today's theme. We'll be back here when you're ready. Welcome, Tony. This week we read the story of the risen Jesus and the disciples on the road to Emmaus. This is one of those stories that seems to have many different layers of meaning. It does. It's also one of my favorite passages in the Gospels because it's so rich in meaning. It's also very mysterious. The disciples knew Jesus, yet they don't recognize him as he walks with them. That's right, and, and it's a point that's central to the story. When we look at the stories of the risen Lord in the Gospels, we can notice that people don't see Jesus as much as he is revealed to them. Mm. See, visions of the risen Lord come through faith and revelation, not, not through normal eyesight. Mm. It involves more than just sight. It involves insight. The entire story that we read today revolves around this theme of insight. It's a journey from blindness and ignorance to insight and faith. I remember that Luke focused on the Jerusalem journey in his gospel. We have another journey this week from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Good point. Luke, Luke loves this metaphor. Mm. As the disciples walk with a stranger in their midst, they tell him all about the great prophet they came to know on the first journey and the culmination of that journey with his death in Jerusalem. They don't realize that the journey is continuing as they speak. And what seemed to be the end was really only a new beginning. Jesus explains the scriptures to them as they walk along. Does the Old Testament clearly predict that the Messiah would suffer and die? The short answer is no, it doesn't. Uh, on the contrary, the Messiah was understood in primarily political, military, and religious categories. But the notion of a suffering Messiah was virtually non-existent. Well, then, how can Jesus say that scriptures said that the Messiah must suffer and die? It's only after the death of Jesus that the Hebrew scriptures could now be read in a new light and reinterpreted mm -hmm. in light of Christ. The early church began to focus on passages from Isaiah, which spoke of God's suffering servant, and it interpreted those passages to refer to the Messiah. They finally recognized Jesus at the breaking of the bread. This is obviously trying to tell us something about the Eucharist as well as the resurrection. Exactly. The language reflects that at the Last Supper. Jesus takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, distributes it. 
So there's really no missing the point there, just in the language. And the idea behind it is that the risen Lord is present to us in the Eucharist, or the breaking of the bread, as they called it at the time. They finally recognize Jesus, and he immediately vanishes from their sight. Why is that? The presence of the risen Lord is profoundly different than the presence of the earthly Jesus. This encounter with the, the risen Lord is, is this revelatory moment, and by its nature, it must be transitory, although its effects will be profound and long-lasting. It's a religious experience of the presence of God in the risen Christ, and one cannot cling to such experiences. They come and they go, but they change us forever. And it changed those disciples as well. Immediately they turn around and begin to proclaim the good news to the apostles. Exactly. To meet the risen Lord is an experience of profound joy, and joy of its nature seeks to share itself with others. Does the story tell us anything about the presence of the risen Lord for us today? Well, it does, and, and in some ways that's one of its main points, is that the, the risen Lord continues to be present to us in Eucharist and in the Scriptures as they break open the Word. So we need to find continual nourishment in them, like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, we need to learn how to discern the presence of the risen Lord in our midst. And the Eucharist and Scriptures are central to that task. As you think about the importance of the Eucharist in our lives as Christians, listen and watch as the Sunday to Sunday players proclaim the Gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Two disciples of Jesus that same day, the first day of the Sabbath, were making their way to a village named Emmaus, seven miles distant from Jerusalem, discussing as they went all that had happened. In the course of their lively exchange, Jesus approached and began to walk along with them. However, they were restrained from recognizing him. He said, What are you discussing as you go your way? They halted in distress, and one of them, Cleopas by name, asked him, Are you the only resident of Jerusalem who does not know the things that went on there these past few days? What things? All those that had to do with Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet powerful in word and deed, in the eyes of God and all the people. How our chief priests and leaders delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. We were hoping he was the one that would set Israel free. Besides all this, today, the third day since these things happened, some women of our group have just brought us some astonishing news. Well, they were at the tomb before dawn and failed to find his body, but returned with the tale that they had seen a vision of angels who declared he was alive. Some of our number went to the tomb and found it to be just as the women said. But him, they did not see. What little sense you have. How slow you are to believe all that the prophets have announced. Did not the Son of Man have to undergo all this so as to enter into his glory? Beginning then with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them every passage of scripture which referred to him. By now they were near the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going farther. But they pressed him. Stay with us. It's nearly evening. The day is practically over. They got up immediately and returned to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven and the rest of the company assembled. They were greeted with, The Lord has been raised. It is true. He has appeared to Simon. Then they recounted what had happened on the road and how they had come to know him in the breaking of the bread. Tony Marinelli has some thoughts about books, the Bible, and you. Thanks, Carol. I looked on my bookshelves the other day and counted the books that I have just on the topic of the scriptures. The number's over 50. Now these books help me to understand the various books in, of the Bible. And they were written by biblical scholars who spent countless hours studying every possible facet of the scriptures. But 
it's possible to read all these books and do all that research and still not understand what the Bible is all about. Because ultimately, the Bible is a book about an encounter between God and us. It's about God working through Israel and Jesus Christ. And its meaning can be studied by the scholar, but it can only be truly known and understood through faith. The stories that we read each Sunday are the same ones over and over again, and yet they never grow old because we keep changing and growing in our faith. It's the same story, but it's read each year by a person who's a year older and wiser and who stands in a different place. In other words, we must bring our hearts and souls into the Bible. The scholars play a very important role. They help us to understand the text. But your job and mine goes beyond that. What do these stories mean for me today? How does this story illuminate the story of my life? This is the second level of the scriptures. And it's the level that Jesus enters into today with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They're well acquainted with the scriptures. He challenges them to interpret the Bible anew in light of their new experience of the person of Jesus. And with Christ as the guide, their hearts burn within them as he interprets the word. When we bring our own experience, our own lives into the text, its meaning expands. The story of the risen Lord on the road to Emmaus was meant to teach the early church about the presence of the risen Lord in the scriptures and the Eucharist. But for us today, it may point to other ways in which the Lord is present. To begin with, the story gives us a great metaphor for our faith. It's a journey. It involves walking together, sharing our lives and stories with each other, and bringing the memory of Jesus into the stories of our lives. Faith doesn't mean having all the answers, but together seeking the truth. And faith can mean emptiness as well as fullness sadness as well as joy as these men walked in grief. As we read the story today, we are the disciples who walk on the road. For the disciples on the road, for us, the Lord is present as we grieve the loss of a beloved friend. He is present as our deepest hopes fall apart around us as they did for those two disciples. The Lord is with us when we welcome the stranger in our midst and we open our mind to new possibilities, as they did. As we enter the story of the road to Emmaus, we should try to find the mystery of our own lives and loves and losses. We're invited to see Christ in the midst of all of it. And then, at the end of the story, the risen Lord disappears as mysteriously as he appeared. There's no clinging to him. There is no capturing the resurrection. We can't bottle it and sell it. But we can't forget it either. And because of it, our lives can never be the same. Thanks, Tony. Whenever it's time for discussion, we have some discussion starters for you, and today is no exception. How encouraging are you to converts who join the community of faith to which you belong? Here's the second one. How important is it to you to understand the scriptures? And a third, how do you find faith in God's word? I sure do hope these starters are a help to your discussion. When you've finished with it, come back to the tape. Maggie Linton is waiting.
The early Christians certainly had a difficult time dealing with the authorities and the threats of everyday people, but prayer and worship was essential to their lives. What was that worship like? I've asked Maggie Linton to find out, which she does on this Bible background. Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, which we recently celebrated, is called the birthday of the church. But the Greek word ekklesia, which we translate as church, originally meant an assembly or gathering of people. So the simple gathering together of the early Christians to remember Jesus and prepare for his return was church. In the beginning, Jerusalem remained the gathering place and the temple, the place of worship. But soon the Christians began to celebrate the new covenant by sharing the Lord's Supper in their own homes. This gathering together in prayer and remembrance came to be called agape, or love feast. At first, the Lord's Supper took place on Sunday evening, the day Jesus rose from the dead. Much like our potluck suppers, each guest brought a dish of food to share. The meal began with a common prayer. Then they ate small pieces of bread broken from a common loaf. The meal closed with the sharing of a cup of wine and another prayer. During the meal, there was fellowship and caring concern for the needs of the group. After the meal, each returned home renewed and remembering Jesus' love for them. Scripture scholars believe another service was held on Sunday morning, either in temple, at the synagogue, or in private homes. The format was quite simple. One of the apostles read the scriptures and explained God's word to those present. Some of the men spoke openly and gave testimony to God's presence and gifts in their lives. Then they all sang songs and encouraged each other to live God's word. For Bible Background, I'm Maggie Linton. Tony, it's your turn to go first this week on the question, what is God calling me to do this week? This, this notion of um, entering into the story, you know, and allowing the story to, to change our lives and things like that. So first thing I'm doing, I'm doing a couple of things. I'm, I'm recommitting myself to early morning time to enter into the story and to make it a daily thing. But also what I'd like to do is, I, I don't do enough communal stuff with it. And I've always found that can be very, very powerful. So um, I'm going to start to work, see if I can work with a group of people, get a group going in the parish, who can start using these stories weekly, bringing their lives and their faith to them. And then maybe see if I can use that group as a group to invite RCIA people into, rather than just doing an RCIA group. Okay, explore that for me a little bit. This group would get together. Yeah, and we'd, we'd, we'd read the readings, and rather than me wax eloquently about their meaning from a scholarly point of which view. Which has its value. Which certainly <laughs> has its value. You know, in, you know, the normal teaching mode that I'm kind of in, here I would just be another person in the group, and how does this talk to our experience of faith? And it's interesting, one of the ways that I've done this, when I've done this in the past, uh, is just to ask people, listen to the readings, try and pray the readings, and listen for a line to come up out of the text. Mm -hmm. and, and stay with the line and see where it takes you. It's, it's amazing where, where I've seen that happen in the past. But right now I could see if I could recharge this, this um, group kind of thing. It's, it can be very powerful. It's what people do with Sunday to Sunday very often. Yes. It's, it's why they have these tapes. And, when they shut us off <laughs> is hopefully when... The story continues. <laughs> yeah, the story continues when it gets good. <laughs> you know, so. um, the notion of story uh, made me think immediately of uh, Nicholas, my son, who learns by story. So if he knows the story of Newton and how he got to his discoveries, uh, then he can, he can enter into the story more, uh, get, gather information more. So what I was thinking is that um, they're good with tape. They like 
taping people, videotaping and audio taping. I don't mean, you know, <laughs> with their permission. Of course. <laughs> and uh, that they might just interview, uh, and I, maybe it's similar to what you're talking about, but for their knowledge, family members, um, their stories of faith. And, um, and I thought, actually, that if they, if they documented those stories then and had them in print, then that would be a, a, a nice document for the family. It'd be great. I have to decide some stories might be better than other stories. Yeah, the family <laughs> stories, yeah. I think that would Sound be like they have their, their mother's uh, theatrical genes here or their, you know. It's interesting. Yeah. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. I'm trying to steer them in other directions, <laughs> but it's just, you know. Be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Let me write the story for you. Be a lawyer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, Tony and I have discussed God's call this week. It's time for you to do the very same thing. When you've completed that short task, come back to the tape for a closing prayer. Easter is a time for resurrection joy, and whenever the St. Augustine's choir sings, you know there's going to be joy. But there's joy, too, that can be subdued when we reflect about the fact that we were saved by the blood of the Lamb. Thanks for being with us today. We've completed another edition of Sunday to Sunday. 
Next week, Father Ganey will be here with the 400th Sunday to Sunday program. That's a whole lot of television. So be sure to join us. Till then, for all the folks at Paulist Media Works, I'm Carol Lehan. Bye. Hello there, and welcome to Sunday to Sunday. I'm Carol Lehan. This is a quite special Sunday to Sunday because it's the 400th one that we've produced. And fittingly enough, the man who produced all of them will be in the studio today sharing about the scripture readings. Father John Ganey is the person who brings everything you see on Sunday to Sunday together. And beyond that, he makes time to create a radio program that is heard all across the United States and also to work weekends at the Visitation Parish in Darnstown, Maryland. The Sunday to Sunday players will proclaim the gospel. This week it comes from St. John. Because the gospel speaks about being a shepherd, Maggie Linton will spend some time exploring the everyday life of a shepherd in Israel on Bible background and will bring the program to a close with a hymn prayer sung for us by the Georgetown Chorale. It's all part of Sunday to Sunday for the fourth Sunday of Easter, 1999. Sometimes a short bite of a reading provides a large meal of explanation. Today's first reading from Acts is one of those times. Peter is preaching, trying to explain the Pentecost event to anyone who would listen. These signs of speaking in tongues, of the wind, of the fire, all those signs of God's power demand an explanation as far as Luke is concerned, and he tries to provide it. For Luke, the signs of God are just that, signs, and they offer a person the opportunity to believe or not to believe. And it is the signs, and the most wonderful sign of all, Jesus' resurrection, that Peter is trying to explain. Peter tells the people that they have been promised and will receive a baptism that will give them the gift of the Holy Spirit. He reminds the people that this gift is for them and for all the generations to come. The number 3,000 that is mentioned in the scripture is to tell us that a substantial number of the people did indeed believe in their Messiah. It also tells us that salvation is both individual and communal. Each person must accept salvation in Jesus individually, but we are baptized into the people of God and saved as members of the church. The reading is in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 14, and verses 36 through 41. There's a blandness to today's second reading that masks the intent. In the second chapter of Peter's first letter, he addresses various constituencies and how they ought to live. 
He's basically looking at the moral lives of his people. He tells the early Christians how to be good citizens and then addresses those who are slaves. It's in this context that today's reading must be seen. What Peter says is that a person can suffer. And there was no question that slaves at that time suffered bitterly, meaningfully by joining that suffering to the suffering of Christ. So Peter is giving us a model of suffering, saying that Jesus was able to save people by his wounds, and he is urging slaves to do the same. The troubling part of this pericope and the rest of Peter's letter is that there are no instructions for those who owned slaves. And it begs the question about when we must recognize the evil of slavery in and of itself. You'll find the reading in the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, verses 20 to 25. And the Gospel will be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Those are the readings for the day. Be sure that everyone in your group has had a chance to read the scriptures for the day and then share briefly about what you think the theme of today's readings is. Father G has joined me. 400, lots of television programs That's there. That's for sure. Congratulations to Tony and to you being here for all of those. And to you for being our producer. Kudos too to all the people <laughs> who are behind the cameras, do the teleprompter, get the sound right, make the pictures for us, as well as the editing team that puts it all together. 400 television programs is a significant number. It is. I'm tired. I need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Can't so, have one. <laughs> so, Father, what's the major point about the scriptures on this Especially significant program. Oh, we're going to get to Scripture. Okay. I would say the most significant point about today's Gospel reading is that this is the only parable that's found in all of John's Gospel. The synoptics use many parables, but this is the only one found in John. And what clues is the parable putting out there for us to see? Well, it's pretty clear, Carol, that Jesus identifies himself as the shepherd, the one who will lead his people, or at least those who choose to follow him, to salvation. Jesus also points out that there will be others, marauders they are called, who will try to lead the people astray. Jesus talks about being both a shepherd and a gate. So is there just one parable or two? Well, the, school, the, schoolers, the scholars are going to argue <laughs> that there are two parables here that were joined perhaps by the oral tradition of people telling this story or perhaps joined by the evangelist himself. We, we really don't know. And I'm not sure it matters since Jesus identifies himself as both shepherd and gate. And therefore it says to us that through him we will find salvation and we will find it abundantly. One phrase here stands out because it seems to contradict what Jesus has said at other points. All who came before me are robbers and thieves. Yeah, it's kind of sweeping, isn't it? Yeah. All who came before <laughs> me. I mean, you just think, whoa, <laughs> this is everybody. So does Jesus mean that all the prophets, the people like Moses and Abraham, is that what he's talking about? Well, clearly not, because he has previously claimed them as witnesses to his life and mission. So what seems to be the case here is John's predilection to say in no uncertain terms that the current leaders of the people are missing the boat. Note that earlier in the passage, the author points out, the Pharisees did not realize what he was trying to tell them. And what was he trying to tell them? That he came so that people might have life in God and have it in rich abundance. While you think about the abundance of God's life, listen and watch as the Sunday to Sunday players proclaim John's Gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, Truly I assure you, whoever does not enter the sheepfold through the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a marauder. The one who enters through the gate is shepherd of the sheep, and the keeper opens the gate for him. The sheep hear his voice as he calls his own by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all those that are his, he walks in front of them. And the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will not follow a stranger, 
Such a one they will flee because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Even though Jesus used this figure with them, they did not grasp what he was trying to tell them. He therefore said to them again, I solemnly assure you, I am the sheep gate. All who came before me were thieves and marauders whom the sheep did not heed. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be safe. He will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and slaughter and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it to the full. Father G has a reflection about being a shepherd and a gate at the same time. Thanks, Carol. It would be easy today to say that pastors should be shepherds of their flocks just as Jesus was. I also think it would miss the point of today's reading. In the reading, Jesus is both shepherd and gate. That gate image reminds us that Jesus is the way to life, and he leads us on that way. We could say that's one and the same thing, but it isn't, because Jesus is the way to life. Jesus is himself life, and he leads us to that life by laying down his own life for each of us. Now, what is that saying to you and to me about our lives, especially during the Easter season? We are the flock, all of us, and Jesus is our shepherd. Because he's given his life for us, he leads us to life with God. Our task as a community of people is to model Jesus' relationship with God, a relationship that is one of deep love. At the last meeting of the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, the bishops pointed out that one of the great challenges for Christians as we approach a new millennium is as old as our faith. How do we connect worship on Sunday to work on Monday? Well, each of us has to take on that question in our daily lives and live those lives trying to make that connection so that we are whole and holy people. Thanks, Father G. As you are more than aware, we've rolled around to discussion time, and to ease our way into discussion, I have some starters for you. The first one is, is salvation only a personal matter? How is Jesus both a shepherd and a gate? Our final starter is this. How do you make worship on Sunday part of work on Monday? Discussion is coming right up. When you've finished there, come back to the tape. Maggie Linton will be here. Jesus is often depicted in the scriptures as a shepherd, so I've asked Maggie Linton to tell us more about the life of a shepherd, which she does on this Bible background. Did you know that shepherds and sheep are mentioned over 500 times in the Bible? There are the familiar passages like the one from Psalm 23. But did you know that Abel was a shepherd? You'll find that story in Genesis chapter 4, verse 2. Jesus frequently used the shepherd in his parables and stories. It's also a popular symbol of early Christian art found in famous paintings and statues. The shepherd of biblical times was usually the youngest boy of a family. Each older son would move on to other, more interesting work, leaving the lonely, less pleasant job of tending the flock to his younger brother. The shepherd's clothing was very simple. He wore a plain cotton robe with a leather belt. For cooler weather or late in the day, he wore an outer coat called an abba. The abba was made of camel hair or coarse wool, which the shepherd spun himself. It's not unlike the ponchos that are still seen in South America and Mexico today. This abba kept the shepherd dry when it rained and was used as a warm blanket at night. 
On his head, the shepherd wore a piece of cotton cloth, which he tied on with a thick black cord made of goat hair. He wore dyed ram skin shoes. The shepherd carried a short stick for poking and counting the sheep as they entered the pen. He also had a larger staff to help with climbing in steep pastures. This staff, combined with a sling, prepared the shepherd to protect his sheep. To help fill the long, lonely hours on the hillside, the shepherd often carved a flute from two pieces of reed. The simple, doleful sound of the shepherd's flute is still heard in the Judean hills today. For Bible Background, I'm Maggie Linton. Father G, what thoughts come to mind when you think about what God is calling you to do this week? Well, I'll tell you what comes to mind. The, the quickest thing that comes to mind is our role in uh, being part of the people of God. Um, I oftentimes think that people think about priests as being kind of like here and, you know, the people are here, whereas basically we're all the people of God. You know, the Pope and, and, uh, and Mary Ann that just became a Catholic, you know, two minutes ago, uh, we're all part of the people of God, and that's, that's what's very key for us, and I think we have to kind of keep on thinking about that. And also, you know, asking that question the bishops asked in that document they put out in November, um, how do we make church on Sunday work, you know, come to work on Monday? And I think that's a real difficulty in, in our society. You know, we, we tend to, to put things in isolation. You know, Sunday I go to church and that's, you know, I take care of God. Now Monday I go to work mm -hmm. and there, there's no relationship to, to those two things. And I think that's basically what the gospel is telling us. So I think for me, it's important that I do the same thing, that I, that I realize that when I lead worship on Sunday, I also have to bring that leadership into Monday and all the rest of the days of the right. week so that we're really doing what God is asking us to do throughout the week so that in, in that sense we're worshiping you know every day by doing what we are called on to do so this week I'm going to just kind of sit back and reflect a little bit about what is it that I'm required to do as a priest in our society to make sure that people understand that you know Monday through Saturday is just as important as the work we do on Sunday in fact that's where we apply hopefully what we're learning on Sunday to, uh, to, the, to the daily tasks that we do. So that's what I'm going to be. So it's a good on. question, worthy of thought. Maybe not enough time for me to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you think that way anyway. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I'm, I'm not as challenged by work on Monday, even in a non-denominational private school teaching on Monday, as I am. I think right now the big challenge for me is in um, neighborhood kids. Okay. <laughs> my my relationship with some neighborhood kids, which which challenge me because uh, you don't like them, huh? Well, my <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you know I think uh, uh, my kids growing up and things that they're learning, and I want to just yank them out and say, no, you won't be exposed to yeah, this. Right, Do you know, right. I'm just going to sure. protect you from this, and I'm their shepherd <laughs> yeah, right. right there, yeah. you know, and I'm just right. guarding, and I can turn into some demon, mm. mother, protecting two boys. <laughs> person, you know? Just yeah, saying, sure, uh, sure. So and that's I, good. I mean, that's important. You have to do that. But this, on, this, on the other hand... But it's not... Th I'm not crossing over very well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I flip we, the switch, and, right. um, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't think about how I'm protecting. Yeah. I just... Pro Get out I, there and do and it. I, yeah, I, I, it can be lashing. It can be... I, I can turn into a different person. It's like yeah. going to buy a car from me. I turn into a different person. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, some different. defensive um, animal. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I really have to uh, check that in myself. Yeah, I think one quickly, of the, yeah, <laughs> not I think just this week. Of, I think one of the <laughs> toughest things that we have as Christians is what I call that tension that exists all the time between what we find ourselves doing and what we know we're called to do. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to do that. And we, we keep on thinking, oh no, nothing to it. I go to church on Sunday, everything's beautiful. Mm -mm, no. Making that connection is tough. And I think the yeah. longer we stay at it, the tougher those connections get because we begin to realize the complexity of all the right. problems that are around us. Go, going into school and teaching is still theory to me. 
So I can cover theory <laughs> really yeah, well, right. but the action, the reality is when I'm at home. Yep. Yeah, there it is. Well, you've heard Father G and me exchange views about God's call. It's time now for you to do the same thing. And when you finish that quick task, come back here for a closing prayer. Normally, Carol would introduce a closing prayer right now, but this week's program is special for two reasons. It's the 400th program we've created, and it will be my last Sunday to Sunday as producer and as one of the talents for the program. I'm going to be taking a sabbatical for the next nine months or so, reflecting, traveling, and looking for new opportunities as a priest in media ministry. I wanted you as our viewers and partners in Sunday to Sunday to know that and to be able to thank Carol and Tony publicly for the wonderful work they've done over the years with me. Our crews and friends who helped put the show together so many times know how grateful I am to them, too. And since this is where we normally close our program with prayer, I'd like to leave you with the hymn prayer that best reflects my hope for you. It's sung by the Georgetown Chorale. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Another Sunday to Sunday comes to a close. Tony Marinelli will be here next week explaining the scriptures. Be sure to join us. Till then, for all of us at Paulist Media Works, we want to thank Father Ganey for his work with the show. And I say, I'm Carol Lehan. Bye.